<clears throat> we consider this morning in the preaching of the gospel, the fifth commandment, and we read of that this morning from Deuteronomy 5. The fifth commandment comes to us and reminds us to, and commands us to honor our father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be long, may be well with you in the land which the Lord your God is giving you. And we consider this with the help of the catechism that reminds us in so many words, Lord's Day 39, that this commandment uh, requires of us that we show all love, honor, and fidelity to our parents, but also that we submit to all in authority, as well that we bear with our weaknesses and infirmities, and the reason is God has been pleased to govern us by their hand. We want to consider this fifth commandment once again in the light of Jude, and so let's turn to Jude, which is often an overlooked epistle, but we've been considering Jude also last time, but now as well, this time in the light of its teaching here about those who rejected and despised authorities in the early church. And so we need to hear from Jude and from the Word of God here so that we ourselves are edified. And so in the end, we will be found not despising the authorities, but keeping the commandments of God, honoring the authorities, and building ourselves up in the most holy faith. But I'm going to read the whole chapter except the last two verses, which will be our benediction for uh, this, e this morning. Jude, the word of God. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Just to comment on that, these ungodly men who were turning the grace of our God into lewdness were using the truth of grace as an excuse to live whatever way they wanted to, even into the most vile of perversities. That's what that means, turning the grace of God into lewdness. It also included, of course, denying the lordship of God in Jesus Christ revealed. Something for us to remember. Jesus, if he's our Savior, is our Lord as well. We are to submit to him and not just do whatever we want. In verse 5, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this and forgotten, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. The angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them! For they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts. They were joining the church, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, 
foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds, which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons, worldly, who cause divisions, not having the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Thus far we read at Jude and we especially want to focus on uh, verse 8 and 20 and 21. Here's the dreamers. Likewise, also these dreamers, verse 8, defile the flesh. They're likened unto the reprobate angels and to Sodom and Gomorrites. These, likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. And then we are contrasted with these dreamers. You, beloved, verse 20, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. It is not surprising that there is <clears throat> decadence in our society today because this was the result of the fall. And if Adam had any wits about him and Eve, when they fell, they could have known, and they would have known, that their choosing against God would result in the total destruction of society as well as of the souls of men. But they didn't. Such was the ignorance and blindness of their sin, and they fell. I want to point us today to the result of the fall from the point of view of its being a complete wreckage of society. That's going to be my first point. And secondly, we want, or, and we want in that point to be turned to lament for this, this terrible upheaval of society. But then secondly, we want to turn to the builder and we want to believe. And the builder is Jesus who makes a wonderful building out of the wreckage. And finally, we want to be called here and to turn here to build ourselves up on the building and the foundation that Jesus has laid as we would praise God in this. So what I want to do is revisit this whole fifth commandment under the theme, Calling All Dreamers, and there we're led to uh, popular culture and to things that are going on in this, in this land but also to our text, which speaks of the despisers of authority as dreamers, verse 8. And want to consider just what we should be doing in this world. And I want to be right open with you. This is a very humbling uh, subject for us who are ourselves naturally vain dreamers but now are called to be those who've received revelation from God and are called to be distinct from the vain dreamers. Again, not surprising when Adam fell and he chose for the word of Satan that would, there would be all this destruction as a result of it. Because what Adam was doing and what the principal sin of the fall is in Genesis 3 
was despising the authority of God. That's what he was doing. God had said, don't eat of this forbidden fruit. And Adam said, listening to Eve and Eve to the devil, I'm going to do whatever I want. And by that, there was a defiance of what God had said. Satan, the great deceiver, the great liar, put the question into the mind of Eve, has God really said these things? And then, by and by, he started denying that God really meant what he said and that the consequences, as God had given them, would be such as he'd laid out for them, even death, if they disobeyed. And so Eve, and then Adam, and then the whole race was plummeted into this sort of defiance, and it's all about not respecting the authority of God as revealed in his word. That's how you disrespect the authority of God. You don't listen to what he says. And so the result of it is all of the authorities that God had ordained, and we saw this last time, are twisted. And they are born as those who, like Adam and Eve, don't really listen to God, and don't want to, even in their place of called representatives of God. That's what authorities are, as we saw last time. Authorities are representatives of God. They are to stand in the place of God over those who are under them in their sphere, and they are to say things that are in accordance with the will of God and for the good of their circle of authority. So for the governors, they're called to rule in the name of God. That's their calling. That's why they're there to be representatives of the holiness and the righteousness of God and to fulfill the purposes of God in government, to provide good order and uh, peaceableness and the defense of nations and societies under their jurisdiction. And the government, as we've seen in another sermon in Romans 13, is called to do this and thus to reward the outward good and to punish the outward evil and to throw them in prison or even execute the justice of God in their punishing the evildoers of society. In the church, the church officials are called to represent Christ and his gospel and to rule over the flock with great humility and faithfulness on behalf of Christ. Homes and men in the homes are called to lead their wives and their families in the way of the gospel and in the fear and nurture of the Lord. But all of this, I say, is beyond this fallen world. It's not understood by this fallen world, such as the depravity of man. The authority of God is denied. That's sin. The questioning of authority is every, what everybody is all about, questioning the word of God. And this enlightened 21st century is all about saying, that's the stuff of religionists, and all they do with their saying there's one word of God is cause trouble. And so we're going to imagine a world without religion, and we're going to be better off for it and more united in our humanity. So all of this is going on, and it's not surprising that sin has progressed and the effect of the fall in denying the word of God has progressed so that people have started and increasingly have started to substitute for God's authorities their own authorities who would solve the problems that people think are the real problems, economic or geographic, were not born in the right country, and they would provide the funding for this, and they would rule according to their own imaginations. 
And so you have society that thinks it is in the right and authorities that think they are in the right for really just doing whatever they want. And even to say that we have authorities in a democracy that are of the people and for the people, that's not correct. Authorities that be are of God, and they should always be remembered as of God. So you have unrest. And you have disrespect of authorities who act disrespectfully, disrespect of constitutions that don't, they're just words of men. If we've got our dreams, we should be able to transgress laws. We should let people in. If we've got our dreams of uh, getting workers in who can help us out and we can make more money because Americans don't want to work, then we should let these people in, regardless of the legality of it all and whether they've waited online or not. I'm not here to preach that I have political answers to this mess in America. I'm not going to say we ought to build a wall or not, or to do this or that. You don't want to hear that from me. I'm here to say, though, that this is all part of a greater problem, and it's disrespect of God's own justice and of denial of his mercy. And we cannot understand and cannot figure out a solution ultimately to all the problems of our economy and our society and of our nation and of the world simply in light of things that might work for now, things that might make money for us now. That's the solution is we return to God. That's it. And I mentioned this a bit last time, but I mentioned as well something that Jude reminds us of, that this despising of authority and this disregard completely of the word of God is finding its way and has found its way in the church big time. You have in Jude, for example, in the first century, Jude writing of certain men who crept in unnoticed and they deny the faith. They deny the faith. They're ungodly and they turn the grace of our God into lewdness they deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jude writes and he says, earnestly contend for the faith against these who've crept in. And a fruit of their denying the word of God is their denying the authorities, as verse 8 reminds us. They defile the flesh and they reject authority, all authority. And they speak evil of dignitaries, could be translated glorious ones, people in authority or high, maybe even authorities in the angelic world. So they have no concept of God, no understanding of the fear and honor of God in his word revealed and in the authorities that are supposed to represent God according to God's own appointment and his revelation. In the church, that's what Jude is warning about here. It's not a theory, it's a reality. And we need to remind ourselves of this because this is exactly what's happening in our community of churches in our day in Grand Rapids in the Reformed and Presbyterian and whatever else evangelical world, there's a denial of the Word of God. And if you deny, you see, the Word of God, there's just no way you're going to begin to comprehend what obedience to the fifth commandment that says honor the authorities is, because the authority of all the authorities is the Word of God. And if you're going to deny the word of the word, which is Jesus Christ, which these deniers do and did, then the church is a sham. It's a fake church. 
built on dreams, vain dreams of these dreamers. You see, the church learns well from the world. The world's full of dreamers. They, they know that they're not happy. There's no source of peace and solace and anything here below. So they have their own dreams. Well, the church has become like that. Come and, and be a dreamer. That is, worry about the word of God so much. Yes, it's, it's God's word in, in essence, but don't be so picky about it. Don't be so punctilious about your doctrine. Don't have a doctrine class at Calvin College. Don't instruct your children in the catechism and in the Reformed faith. There's many ways of looking at things, and, and this is what's going on. The authority of the Word of God, even in evangelicalism, is all but denied nowadays by people who are making loopholes for this and loopholes for that. And You can dream about who you are and who you're meant to be and what your identity is, your sexual preference is. That's okay, because we're church after all. And the God who is love is now the one who's being substituted for just the love of man. Where are the preachers and the elders who demanded the preachers to say, Thus saith the Lord? You know what the church has become? It's, it's really an anti-authoritarian institute now. There's no word of God. There's no one word of God. There's a kind of a vague, a vague sense of this or that, but it's not a word. And there's no real elder authority, but it's become... As one has described this in an article I read, the church has become like a, a supermarket. And so we shop for churches. We shop. When you come to a church, you shop. And if you like what you receive one Sunday, you come again. And maybe you go down the aisles and you find what you can, can from whatever's in this church and and you can be happy here, or, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe after two, three weeks, you go to another place because, well, the minister said something. And it wasn't so exciting this week as last week, and so I'm going to go somewhere else. And I've heard on the Internet that this guy is really good. Or that this church is really tolerant of all kinds of people, and so I'm going to go there. I'm going to go there. And in those churches, of course, supermarket churches, the customer is always right. And the elders know that, and so they don't want to be found not being able to market what they have to sell, and so they don't want to step on anybody's toes. And, and they offer things for sale. It's on sale today, the gospel. Come and get it. And the hard thing about the incarnation and God is with us, uh, we're just not going to preach on that today or, or maybe for these next six months. And the truth of election we'll just put to the side. The truth that Jesus is the Savior of only his elect, that definitely is not going to be heard from this pulpit because it's not something that's so palatable. So let's tell you something. Jesus is nice. Thus saith Reverend Domini Sma. Jesus is nice. And he's nice to you, and he really loves you where you're at, and don't worry about your lifestyle, because I understand. I made you that way, after all. So come as you are. And here we have this church, it's acting a lot like the first century church that welcomed the dreamers in. Who defiled the flesh and rejected the authority of the word and any kind of semblance of 
church discipline. They denied, after all, the grace of God. They used that as an excuse for lewdness, but they also denied the lordship of God. They denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And that meant they didn't know Jesus was the Savior either. So they came in, and they crept in, and they, lo and behold, verse 12, they're sitting at their love feast, eating at the communion table. And then in verse 16, it says they're coming according to their lust, and they're speaking great and attractive and swelling words and flattering people to gain advantage. Here, you see, is the constitution of the first megachurch. Get people in, ministers in, they are convincing, who flatter people, and so you can fill a whole mall full of people who like to be coddled and told they're okay and all of these things. This is what happens. These sensual persons cause divisions. They don't have the spirit and, and all of this. Now, why do I bring this up? To be ornery? To be grumpy? No. To lament. To lament. The authority of the word of God is, is all but ignored and denied and despised. And you see, you can't be neutral about it. You're going to love the authority of God and the authorities that be and the word of God, or you're going to hate them. Well, these hate them. It's in all the land, and the church is following after the, the God deniers and the authority haters, and, and the thus saith the Lord deniers, who can't imagine that there's only one way to heaven. And it would never say that Arminianism is the lie. Because after all, there are brothers. We have to lament this. And even not from afar, as part of the problem. This is the only way that this word will sink into us. Jude writes to people whom he says are called and they're sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. And the benediction is all to God who would keep us from falling. But that tells us, but for the grace of God, there we go. Denying the authority of the word, the authorities that be. And I'm not talking just about by refusing to pay all our taxes but by denying that Jesus is Savior and Lord of our life, by really taking heed to his word that says this needs to be heard. That's how we deny the authority of God, just like Adam. That's how we're just one with broad evangelicalism and one with the Mexicans and one with the, the Italians and one with everybody else who has everything messed up, one with the Republicans, and one with the Democrats, and thinking maybe we, we need a constitution and, and other things in our lives, and, and all of these will help us, anything, but acknowledging we need Jesus. Anything. Because saying we need Jesus is saying we're going to listen to Jesus, and we don't want to do that, do we? Everywhere... We go, we find this independentism among human beings, and, and we are those human beings. If Adam and Eve in the garden, in perfection, so fell, how great is our falling every day for the same lie of the devil. It's not good enough as Christianity. The gospel is not enough. It can't comfort you when you lose your loved one. It can't. It really can't. Not me. 
And Jesus doesn't know everything. And, and certainly the means of grace and the authorities that be in this local congregation, they're not enough. Thank God that God is the God of mercy. And that's what I turn you to in this point here. We're all being turned with those to whom Jude writes to the Savior. And speaking of all these bad things that had come upon the church and the church in society, Jude would have us go to Jesus, who out of the wreckage built a church. And here's how it works. Here's the gospel, dreamers. God in his great authority as the God who's God. He sends his son and appoints him to be a savior. He appoints his son and his son comes into the garden in the word that God spoke to Adam and Eve. And that son comes to the sons of men history long and then in the fullness of the time and he's God saying, I love you. He's God saying, I take care of the problem of sin. I take care of the problem of your guilt and of your depravity. And I put in you my spirit, and it's all my son. I want you to hear my son. Behold him. And as Isaiah says, I want you to behold him who is my servant. And this is remarkable. God, the great authority, the great God, in all his glory, he comes in the Son who's willing to be a servant, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God. He took on him in, in the form of a servant. This is the greatest authority there ever was in the form of a servant of Jehovah God and of the church. And he comes, does Jesus. And he himself would so serve the will of God and, and go among the, the filthy dreamers and the vain dreamers in every nation, tribe, and tongue. And he would come and he would show something that seems to be so contradictory to human reason. He comes among the wreckage and he says, I'm going to build something here, my church. And he comes among the vain dreamers, and he comes among the church vain dreamers, and he says, I'm going to build my church here, or there, or in Acapulco, or in Bolivia, or in Thailand, or Vietnam, wherever else. I'm going to build my church here by saving sinners. And I'm going to come and I'm going to die for those sinners. That's what they need. That's what they need. They don't need to be led into a certain country and to get ahead. They don't need that. Maybe they think they do. Society doesn't need that everybody's the same. After all, I give authorities. The church doesn't need to be popular, though it may be, whatever that means. You need forgiveness, and Jesus gives that. And you need also the Holy Spirit, otherwise what I've done for you will never be applied to you. So Jesus receives the Holy Spirit as a gift from the Father when he rises from the dead, having paid for all the sins of everyone of the vain and filthy Adamites, his own among them. And he gives the Spirit and he gives faith so that what he did on Calvary is applied to his own. Jesus comes, the servant who does not bruise or break the bruised reed or quench the smoking flax. And he doesn't fail. He's not discouraged until he's established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. And so there's righteousness and mercy in him in the establishment of the kingdom of heaven. What I'm trying to say is, beloved, we need to remember the gospel and to believe that. 
or we're just the proud Pharisees in the church who forget to lament our own sin and our need of the Savior, and that after all, it's only a gift. You realize that? Being in the kingdom of heaven is a, is a gift. It's not about being in a certain country. It's not about being of a certain economic status. It's about being one with God in Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Believe it. And where there are believers and where there's the church of Christ, it, lo and behold, we begin to respect the authority of the word of God. And in the home, for example, there's the beginning of obedience among fathers. And the way, fathers, you love your children and you act honorably is, first of all, you're loving your wife. That's what the children see. And then you love them, and then you bring the word of God to them. That's the beginning of obedience. And lo and behold, this is what Jesus makes. He makes for a people who are naturally filthy dreamers. He makes them to be those who are the recipients of this revelation, as in Acts 2, like the old men who shall dream dreams. It's the only other place in the Bible that the word dreamers is used. It's used of the Pentecostal believers who were given revelation. Those are the good dreamers. Well, in the church of Christ that Jesus builds, there's this beginning of this respect for the word and this honor of the word, and, and that's seen in the homes, and that's where it must be. People of God, it's sovereign grace. If we would be a faithful church, there must be faithful men who lead the way and raise their children in the fear of God. And there must be children. Children, you listened here. The commandment comes to you. Honor your father and your mother. And it doesn't matter if they're your stepfather, your stepmother. You honor your father or your mother that God has given to you. And you love them. And you serve them. And you seek to listen to them and to, and to hear the word that they bring. And parents, you be honorable. Church, you learn what it is to sit at Jesus' feet and to lead this congregation, men, elders, as servants on behalf of the servant. And congregations submit to those elders and pastor and the rule, the government, as those who would have joy in the office. And when they come and would correct you, remember, as the Catechism reminds us, that in the church of Jesus Christ, God is pleased to correct you by the authorities. And it's such a wonderful thing when this is seen in our church. People hear, and when you're admonished and maybe even rebuked, you hear. And you say, yes, you're bringing the word of God. I'm hearing Jesus. I need to repent and be conformed to the image of Christ more. Beautiful. And so this is the beginning, and this is the building that Jesus makes. And, and believe this, beloved. I know it's easy to focus on the wreckage and societal wreckage and church wreckage, and, and we have to pay attention to that lest we be a part of the problem. But let us ever focus on that gospel, shall we not, that Jesus Christ has built something, is building something. It's called the church, where there is the respect once again of the authority. In fact, it's like a return to the paradise that's lost. Even better, it's a pointing ahead to the paradise that shall be heaven itself. This is what we're about, to be the place where heaven has begun. And the authority of God is honored, and people love this because there's blessing in submitting to the easy yoke of Jesus Christ. And there's blessing in hearing the word of God and doing the word of God. And, and then the blessing is also, and this we need to hear, we learn to be those who build up ourselves on the building of God. As Jude reminds the people to whom he writes, you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, 
looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. There you have the beloved distinguished from the vain dreamers and the sensual persons who are given faith and hope and love to be God's people. And in that faith and hope and love, you'll note the last two verses before the benediction. They go out into this world and have compassion. And others save, they save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. That's our calling. Calling all dreamers come to the Savior. Calling all dreamers. Dream the dreams of God now, not your own vain dreams. Calling all dreamers. Don't you know, don't you realize that there's no help for you if your soul is not helped by the Savior, if you're not cleansed by the blood of the Lamb? Calling all dreamers. Believe in one who's better than you are, who's God with us. Calling all dreamers. Renounce your rights and seek the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ. Calling all believing dreamers, don't give up. Build on. For the foundation is laid. With all the authority of God, I say this to you, the foundation of the church is laid. And God the Son by his own authority and power given to him of the Father, is now gathering and defending and preserving his church and bringing them all home into the kingdom of God. Amen. Lord God, we pray, bless the word we heard, that we may ponder anew the things of your own authority and of the wonderful gospel. Give us, Lord, to be reminded, but for the grace of God, we go and we are just like this fallen world, and our homes are just like fallen homes, and churches just like apostate churches, and we are among the society of the corrupt. Have pity, Lord, on us. Thanks with all our hearts we give to you for saving us in Jesus and beginning to make us to be a church home that loves the authority of God, loves the godness of God, loves the word of God, loves the gospel, and loves sinners so that we can be on the great commission for the salvation soon of every one of your own from every nation south of the border or north or east or west, from every nation, tribe and tongue, Lord, use us and be exalted. In Jesus' name, amen.